All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So Regina, we'll uh, turn it to you. Okay, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Regina Meyer, president of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, and I'm thrilled that in these times when we're not able to meet in person, that we can still launch our Meet the Founders series as part of our Make It in Brooklyn initiative. As many of you know, Make It in Brooklyn is Downtown Brooklyn Partnership's um, initiative to highlight and support Brooklyn's entrepreneurial spirit and cultivate the cultivate the innovation ecosystem that the borough is so well known for, while also connecting local talent to job opportunities. This series will focus on the broad variety of industry sectors that thrive in Brooklyn, from fintech to fashion, and brings together local founders and established industry experts for candid conversations, new, uh, focusing on business growth, new products, and developments. And now we're really excited to kick things off today with a session on biotech and engineering. I'm so pleased to be joined by both Dean Yelena Kavachevic at, of the NYU Tandon School of Engineering and also my board chair, and Will Canine, co-founder and chief product officer of biotech startup Opentron, Opentrons. The Dean joined Tandon in, tw in 2018 and is the first woman to head the school since its founding. Before joining Tandon, she was head of electrical and computer engineering and a professor of biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Earlier in her career, she worked at Bell Labs and was a co-founder and technical VP of X Waveforms based here in New York City. Will co-founded uh, Oppentroms in Brooklyn in 2014 after developing an interest in biotech and open source lab automation while completing his master's at NYU interactive tele in NYU's interactive telecommuni telecommunication program. Opentroms, a startup that makes lab robots for biologists has grown to a team of more than 250 people over the past six years and now runs the biggest COVID-19 COVID testing lab in New York City. To give some background on the company in their own words, we'll share a short video. Caroline? A lot of work goes into a new discovery. Writing papers, preparing presentations, reading articles, designing experiments, analyzing data, not to mention lab work. So much repetitive pipetting goes into each discovery, and that's what Opentrons is for, getting your lab work done. This is the OT2, a personal lab robot that takes care of repetitive pipetting accurately and quickly. The OT2 transfers liquid using robotic pipettes that meet or exceed the accuracy and precision of other lab robots. Using high-performance parts and cutting-edge mechanical design techniques, the OT2 is faster than many robots 10 times more expensive. And you can use most standard labware and consumables, just like if you were running your experiments yourself by hand. Except you don't have to run it yourself. With the OT2, you can run a protocol from the other room over Wi-Fi. You can check on the progress of a job remotely and queue up more protocols to run. You can choose one of the protocols developed by our community and submit it from institutions like Stanford and the Mayo Clinic, or make your own automated protocol with the protocol designer. The intuitive visual interface makes it easy to create protocols yourself. Once you have exactly the protocol you want, you can simply send it to the robot to be run. And it's easy to set up a new run. All you need to do is remove your samples from the previous run and put on the new reagents and consumables, securing them easily on the precision-made deck. You've got plenty of work to do. Why not let Opentrons handle some of it for you? Get an OT2 pipetting robot for your lab Oh, that was great. Um, bef before I turn things over, um, we'd like to do a, a quick um, poll to post a single question to all of you to get to know our audience today, to take advantage of this great technology we have.
I know what my answer is, but I don't think I'm allowed to answer. You can't vote. I tried I to vote. <laughs> oh, no. I tried. Yeah, me too. Cool. Okay. Lots of others in the house. Well, we know now know we have a, a really nice range of people here from all sectors. Um, before, so now that um, we know that, we would like to get started. And just so let you know, we'll take questions from the audience at the end of our session. So please use the Q&A feature for any questions you might have. That's great. So my turn now, right? Yes. Uh, so so I mean, it's 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 really interesting. Yeah. I think it's a small world that you know. Uh, Will has a degree from NYU, but we also found another point of contact. Uh, as you heard in in the intro, I was also a professor of biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon, and he just told me that they hired a biomedical engineer from Car Carnegie Mellon. There you go. Um, okay. And another thing that I wanted to say is that when I was doing this, I was doing biomedical imaging and I was sitting at a conference and it was a mixed group of people and there were biology PhD students and they told me that they have a very a high threshold for pain for doing repetitive work. And so I remember as I was yeah. watching your video, right? It's very, very true. I mean, for me, yeah. It was mostly doing repetitive work when it comes to images, let's say segment mm -hmm. a cell. So they would spend three days by hand, you know, doing something. Yeah, staining and yeah. Exactly, staining or, yep. or whatever else. So it's, I'm very excited and I was excited to learn about your company. So, I mean, I can guess, but I don't know if everybody can. So what did you see in the biotech marketplace or space that spurred you to found? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, well, I think that's sort of a multi-layered question for me. Um, you know, I, my background is actually in political activism. Um, I moved to New York for Occupy Wall Street. And before that, I worked on democratic campaigns like progressives for, um, and, and activating the youth vote. Um, and, you know, I went to ITP, which is the program I went to at NYU, when it was still under the Tisch umbrella. Um, but but um, I, it was really with a goal to learn a new way of having an impact on the world because, you know, I tried electoral politics and I tried uh, activism marching on the streets and uh, they're both very powerful for specific jobs, but other jobs really require new tools that empower people in ways that they aren't already empowered. Um, and, and when you do that, when you give somebody the ability to do something that they couldn't do before, that has a major political impact, actually. You know, empowerment is, is, a, is a significant thing. It, it's just the balance of who has access to important technologies and, and means of production. And so when I um, started at ITP, I also gravitated instantly to biotech because I think it's one of the most important technologies. It's how we're gonna feed ourselves. It's how we're gonna heal ourselves. It's how we should be manufacturing things to be in harmony with the ecosystem instead of just extractive of the ecosystem. Um, biotech is increasingly important for you know, human civilization on the planet, but it's also the least accessible technology to most individuals. Um, you can write an app you know, but you can't program a cell if you're a, a person in, in the world right now. Um, and, and even worse, if you're like a standard bench scientist, you don't have access to the best tools to actually do the most sophisticated biotechnology. Um, and so, you know, what, what the specific insights that I sort of saw in, in biotech is that um, individual scientists are vastly underinvested in, in the ecosystem. And instead it's all about big corporate um, organizations 
really. And investing in, in centralized organizations is instead of distributed individuals. And the moment that I that really catalyzed everything was when I was in GenSpace. GenSpace is a biohacker space in Brooklyn. Um, it's the first biohacker space where just an individual can go in and take, I was taking introduction to synthetic biology. They have the biohacker boot camp, um, things like that. Um, and I was learning how to pipette, which is the fundamental action <laughs> of a wet lab moving tiny amounts of liquid around from vial to vial. Um, and I was like, why the heck can't I download this experiment and hit run like I can on my 3D printer? Like, why, why do I have to learn how to do this really well when at school I'm like just downloading somebody else's beautiful machine and, and printing it effortlessly? Um, and, and so that was really where it started was just realizing that there is a huge imbalance in power um, in the biotech ecosystem. And you could really empower individuals with this tool that automated a lot of work for them affordably and in a way that enabled them to share. Um, so that, that was sort of the fundamental insight that OpenTron came from. That's very cool. Uh, you know, I, I'm sort of uh, thinking as an engineer, right? Whenever we see something done once, twice, the third time, we either write the program or design a robot or something like that. So it's kind of inbred. Right. So, right. so what I was telling you before, the you know high threshold for pain, we don't, right? <laughs> like engineers exactly. don't. We think exactly like you, like what yeah. the hell? Why don't we, you know, automate this? But clearly, because yeah. of your interesting background, right, and and you know you're so committed to sort of bettering the society, you clearly listen to people very much. So how have you worked with biologists and and their labs to shape and you know hone your products? Uh, that is a core capability at OpenTrans. You know, we we follow our customer in all. Um, manner of, of product development decisions. Um, and so, you know, the, the thing to remember though is also you, you create the customer that you build for in a way too. So it's always this dialogue of, you know, who are you serving now and who are you aiming to serve later and how can you bridge that from where you are now? And so, um, you know, OpenTron did a pretty common move for a lot of you know new platform technology companies, open platforms, which is the first customer you serve is the hacker, the the really sophisticated technologist who doesn't mind if they have to like turn some wrenches to correct a shipping malfunction. They don't mind if they have to write a lot of code. They want that, um, and and that was the first customer that we shipped to in our Kickstarter, right. Um, was the, the hacker labs. Um, and as we started serving them, you know, I, I thought that it was going to be mostly people like me, like people, amateurs in gen spaces of the world. Um, but MIT, Caltech, um, Harvard, Stanford, all, like, and our Kickstarter was 34 robots, and um, all of them were like professional, serious scientists. <laughs> basically, maybe three or four were like hackers. Um, and that was when it was like, oh, okay, this is a bigger deal than what I thought this was gonna be. This is something that I, the whole ecosystem needs, not just like me at, at GenSpace. Um, so that, that I think was the first moment that was really like, okay, listen to the customer and, and figure out what are they asking for and what do they need? And a, uh, a robust, platform that they can that's really flexible so people can take into their um, lab and maybe it gets them out of the box 80 percent of the way there and it's really easy to build the extra 20 percent that they need to do their particular workflow right so that was the first thing that these people wanted because all the robots out there like they start at fifty thousand dollars they have completely proprietary software stacks you're not allowed to write your own code you have to hire them to write the code for you. Um, and they only work with their proprietary tips and labware and you know, consumables and all that stuff. It's a racket. And 
just giving people an open platform that's cheap and lets them build on top of it, uh, you know, that was the key feature for our first user group, which was a hacker. Um, we've traversed through a lot of different user groups <laughs> on, on the ways where we are now, which is, um, you know, running the biggest COVID diagnostics lab in the city, tens of thousands of samples every day. And the, the user there is um, a lab technician who's only running one thing that's highly regulated, not flexible at all, you know, reporting backwards and forwards and, and all, all throughout with, with custom software and um, biosafety protocols and, and all that stuff. So we've, we've really got, come a long way um, through different, in, in enabling different users. When you build on the product to, net, to have a new feature, now you enable a new user group. And then by asking users who aren't your users yet, but you want to be your users, what do you want? What, what are we missing? Um, then you build that and then they become your users. And, and that's how you scale from being a five person team in, you know, a windowless room in downtown Brooklyn to being a 300 person team um, in, in Dumbo and across the world. Um, yeah, I, I can tell these stories forever, but I love this, this area of yeah, but it's an extremely iterative process going back and forth, yeah. right? you know, and just Always. bouncing back and forth, uh, you know, and building uh, more and more. So, you know, as the dean of an engineering school that has developed a program uh, that's called Bridge to Tandem, uh, which is a crash course that provides skills and knowledge for non-STEM bachelor mm -hmm. degree holders to become qualified to earn, let's say, a master's in computer science and cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And as a founder who has, you know, background in community organizing and campaign management yep. and has moved to STEM, what would you say to somebody else who maybe does not have a STEM background, you know, how would they go yeah. about it? Why would they do it? You know, and, and I, I found, you know, your link between sort of impact and really stem mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. because that's not what you hear very often yeah i mean often stem programs are very focused on how to make something and don't in my opinion ask enough of why, why? are you building this thing um for sure um and you know i i don't think that's necessarily bad i think that the specialization in how is very important and thinking about why is something that everybody needs to be doing. <laughs> um, so I, I think about this question in kind of two two buckets. One is I, you know, majored in social. I majored in political theory, um, and I was, you know, looking to transition out of community organizing as a career and get into something more technology oriented. Um, and I ended up at ICP, which is, um, you know, they describe themselves sometimes as a, a liberal arts education of technology. It's not really um, giving you the skills to go be a professional engineer or web developer or, you know, anything like that. But um, it's really exposing you to, um, you know, get an understanding of what technology is capable of actually, and what it takes to actually marshal it to do something meaningful in the world. Um, and, and not, you know, know enough to necessarily do the whole thing yourself, but be able to synthesize a diverse number of things um, and, and empower the, the specialists that, that are needed to bring about a given project. Um, and, and so I think that those are kind of, they are too, you know, some people talk about being a, a specialist generalist, like my specialty is I'm a generalist. Um, yeah. and, and I think that that is a thing that, you know, being a specialist technologist generalist um, with a biotech expertise is like my, how I would say it. I would never hire myself to write any code or <laughs> run any experiments. 
uh, right? But I know enough to know what a like well-deployed piece of software behaves like and, exactly. and, the, and the requirements um, that people who are gonna engineer that need from me in order to, to successfully execute on that project um, and why and, and what, what's really important to them and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think that you know if if your goal is to pivot in career and become a like cybersecurity analyst, like that's awesome. You're basically choosing to go become a specialist cybersecurity person. But I think that there's also this other move, which is you're not ever actually being the specialist technologist, but you know enough to really effectively communicate with the specialist technologist and and facilitate the process of building something with them because they need other people's help as well it's interesting because when as you're speaking i was thinking when i was working uh you know on biomedical imaging i was working a lot with biologists and, and mds and what i needed to learn is basically what you said it's kind of a vocabulary so i i would know yeah. how to communicate with them to understand what is the important problem and how do we help them solve it not necessarily, I would not become a biologist and I would exactly. not become a doctor and vice versa. They learned how to speak our right. language so that we could together write in an iterative way again, solve yeah. a very you know, practical problem, if you want. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think you know, the, the thing that we're highlighting here is really the efficiency of that iterative process and how fast you can go through those loops is really the make or break difference often between a project working and not working, you know, within the time and budget and, and expertise that you have. And that facilitation, you know, making sure that each loop is actually taking you further in the right direction um, and, and, and facilitating the specialists who are really turning the crank to make the progress happen, that is in a very important job um, within the technology ecosystem as well. You know, it's, it's a, you know, Product is often the umbrella term for people doing that type of facilitation. You know, incidentally, we have a sister program to ITP. It's called mm -hmm. Internet Design and Media that sits in the School of Engineering. And both of them now sit in Brooklyn in 370J. Yeah. So oh, is I know. The, the space is beautiful. Yeah, I have been beautiful. in there. Yeah, it's awesome. So, and, and how do you, since you mentioned before that, you know, you have the largest uh, COVID-19 testing uh, system. So how do you anticipate growing this over the, let's say the next year while it's still really very relevant? Yeah, and if, if it sounds like there might be banging on the wall next door and if it gets too loud, let me know and I'll- It's still good, I think. Somewhere, okay. Um, so our lab is, um, it's, we're, we've licensed some technology actually from NYU Langone, um, the, the hospital and, and medical school um, that enables extremely high throughput and extremely uh, precise and sensitive um, as well as affordable um, qPCR testing. Um, and you know the, this earlier this year, everybody in life science basically stopped what they were doing and started working on COVID, right? It was the, you know, they're, everybody in life science is now working on the same science project. And um, when, when that happened, people like um, Jeff Buka, who is the genomic, system genomics chair at NYU Langone, yeah, um, know you know, yeah, and he, he has this amazing synthetic biology foundry, a super high throughput facility for building synthetic yeast chromosomes. But part of it was that they used for high throughput QC of their, of their constructs could be pretty easily retargeted to COVID diagnostics. Um, and when all of the you know, non-essential work stopped at NYU Langone, um, 70 volunteers stayed on to basically turn that, that genomics pipeline into a COVID diagnostic pipeline. And the key thing is that um, you have to put a bunch of opentrons <laughs> at the front of the pipeline because um, 
it, there's a lot of samples coming in from hospitals in really big tubes that robots don't like. And so you put those on our machine just to turn it into a smaller thing. And then you put it on a work cell that's like $5 million to do it super high throughput and, and um, super sensitive. And so we started working together in the early part of the pandemic response um, just to get you know, some open trons for them to, to work through that process. Um, and it quickly became clear to me that their process was probably, you know, for, for a certain class of problem, the best solution. If you are, have a highly dense area and you just need one site to run a ton of really good tests, um, their, their solution is the, really the best one that bubbled up as a different supply chain that wasn't already maxed out. Um, so a, a possible net addition to already existing testing bandwidth, right? Um, and, and so when, you know, the city started poking around to the whole biotech community being like, you got an idea for how we're going to double testing by November. Um, and this is, you know, mid, mid summer. And, and basically we're like, yeah, I mean, we could, we could use this technology from NYU with like a hundred open trons and build out a new lab that would run very affordable high throughput, highly sensitive tests. And, um, you know, our, because we're really the only company in life science who tries to make things as cheap as possible, that's like our, our whole business model is, is to cut costs for consumers, which is like a radical thing in life science, but is pretty common <laughs> business in, in most of the rest of the economy. Um, we came in about 50% of the overall price that for of, of any of the other bids to the city and so we're you know saving the city hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars in testing and doubling their throughput with a 24-hour turnaround time um so the you know we're we're expanding as fast as the need is expanding for it at this point the bottleneck in the system is no longer can we run enough diagnostic tests in the lab it can we efficiently collect samples from everyone in the world who who needs tests um, and we have some ideas on that but that's um, that's the next order problem now that we have this extremely high throughput lab so uh, it's absolutely amazing and you know kudos to you guys i mean that's where we needed innovation and you know quick thinking i know that earlier this year when when covid hit uh you know a group of our faculty and and students and so on when pp was really in such high demand and yeah. we didn't have it designed the and that was our goal too design a really yeah. fast easy to print like face shield and and you know we open sourced it and Two million of them. I mean, I know that by company standards, that's not much, but you know, two that's million. A lot. <laughs> yeah. used, right. That's and so, how does I mean the the open source is uh, is a big concept, and I know that you place uh, strong emphasis on this. So, how do you? I mean, look, I'm a convert, so you don't have to convince me. But yeah. I would, you know, what is it that you use as arguments to say that you know open source? approach helps advance sure. scientific discovery and actually helps you know in this case healthier world if you want yeah i mean i don't have to make that argument to scientists as you say like yeah. people who do technical things understand why you want something to be open source easy to customize easy to modify fix etc um but the really people who have needed convincing are the investors who are going to fund us to actually build the business that we've built now. Um, and the, you know, the answer is not every investor is going to understand it, which is part of the entrepreneurial journey. If you, if somebody tells you like, you know, really interesting idea, making robots that are cheaper. Um, but how are you going to defend yourself from a Chinese knockoff where you don't have a patent? And we're like, well, we actually don't need a patent because we manufacture everything in Shenzhen ourselves and we are our own Chinese knockoff. Like we're, we're embedded in the ecosystem and, and no one 
is faster than us at the scale that we're at. We, you know, we're, we're first to market. Um, and that argument is compelling to some people and not compelling to other people. Um, the other argument being, you know, our, our defensibility moat is actually our users community because, you know, a robot that saves you three hours of pipetting every day, that's valuable, right? A robot that you can use to download an experimental method that was developed at NYU or Carnegie Mellon or Stanford or any of the thousands of places that are using our robot, that you can just download that method and instantly reproduce it in your lab. That is a whole nother level of, of value for, for the scientific community and for the end user. And by being open and allowing people to share their methods um, share their modifications and their hacks and their customization. Um, we, you know, the, the platform, the open platform becomes more valuable than the organization OpenTrons could ever actually develop it, it to be, right? And, um, and you start getting a network effect where adding a new user now adds benefit to every other user. Um, and, and that just keeps on adding on itself um, and, and gets a lot of momentum. And so, um, you know, the the right the right investors understood that dynamic, and um, some of them are in New York, but most of them are in Silicon Valley, um, and uh, it, it's it's only proven out to be true as our company journey, you know, continues and we start to really scale up our our user base. It just becomes a more and more valuable asset to ourselves and to the life science community. Great. I, it's funny because um, I was thinking the other day, I was looking for something to buy and was debating, you know, among products and one was significantly cheaper than others. Mm -hmm. And my husband was next to me and I was saying like, I don't know if I want to get this one. It's, it's really cheap, What's right? Wrong with it? And he yeah. said, uh, well, go on whatever it's called, meta review or something and, you know, check yeah. it out. It turned out to have fantastic reviews. So, you know, I'm not suggesting... Yeah raise your price but did you see any hesitancy on oh the, yeah on, on absolutely the like the, the too good to be true um impulse was very very well um i mean you know really the only like you already pointed at it the only way to convince most people that your your 10 times cheaper thing is good enough is to get somebody who's not you to tell them that it's good enough you yeah know? Exactly. and especially with scientists um and, and so, you know, that's why it's important to build for the customers that will actually adopt you in the beginning, which are the crazy early adopter hacker people, right? And so you got to build for them so that they love you. And then they'll start telling their friends who aren't hackers that this is really cool. And, and you yeah. can slowly start working yeah. your way that way. You need credibility. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You need credibility and... Um, different people give credibility differently. <laughs> and so you have to find the, the place that you can start, you know, go from zero to one credibility and keep on ramping that as you go. And that's really, you know, the, the finesse of getting a early stage product off the ground. Very cool. Listen, I have just one other quick question and maybe then we open it to the audience. Um, sure. Since you went into sort of biotechnology, but not being a biotechnologist, can you imagine yourself going now to some completely different realm with what you have learned here? Interesting. I mean, I do think that people kind of gravitate to things pretty early. And I was, I didn't get a PhD or something, but you know, in high school, I was like the the nerd collecting pond water and looking at it under <laughs> microscopes. Like okay. biology has always been part of of what I care okay, about. So that's your niche. That's 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 yeah. great. Right? Yeah. So I I don't I I you know I don't think I'm like such a generalist that I could just sort of pick a new thing and, and go anywhere. I really do love biology, but I also understand that I'm not well suited to executing on a precise experiment and, and analyzing, you know, very great granular data. That's not my strength. Um, but you're really so, great at bringing it to life, right? And that's, yeah, uh, that's, I can do other, other stuff. 
Exactly. That, not every uh, biologist can do that. Focus on the other stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. So, um, shall I open it up to questions? Let's see. Happy to. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear from you, you know, looking at the broader Brooklyn technology ecosystem. Um, how does biotech factor into your thinking? Well, I mean, look, uh, we are a technology school. Um, mm -hmm. We are a newcomer at NYU. Uh, we used to be Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute, have a very long history of it. And yeah. one of our foci is really broadly speaking health. And within that, I mean, that connects with many other research foci we have, and that's like AI and robotics, you know, which perfectly yeah. fits what we're talking about. So we have people who do, let's say, Telerehabilitation, right? And and AI is yeah. there because you know the robot can learn as it does, for example, a knee rehab of what you do, what you're doing right, what you're not doing right, and kind of self-adapting. Mm -hmm. You can connect this to another big fo focus we have, which is urban anything, and so urban health and urban mobility and so on. So I mean, health kind of pervades it all. And it's also in some sense pragmatic because we have Langone, which is one of these incredibly uh, exciting and big and, and varied hospital systems, you know, in the city and in the world. Mm -hmm. And we have a new department of biomedical engineering in the school that's populated actually half mm -hmm. by our people and half by people from Langone. So they work yeah. together, okay. right? And that's mm -hmm. really super exciting for somebody who said, and you know, I am an electrical engineer by training um, mm -hmm. and I worked, you know, what I do is what today people would call maybe machine learning. Um, mm -hmm. So I am sort of like a gun for hire. So I have to learn the, the application domain to, again, right. learn the vocabulary and stuff too, so that I can recognize the problem. Then I build the Mm -hmm. sort of algorithmic and mathematical tools that can be put into something to extract knowledge out of data, out of images or yeah. whatever. So it, cool. it really fits well in, in my thinking and definitely need, you know, fits well within what's happening in Brooklyn, what's happening in the city larger mm -hmm. and what we have as a school and as, a, as the university at our disposal. And look, Given the pandemic, I mean, the focus is just going to be even sort of narrower on 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 this. What yeah, we can do in the area of health, and and you know, mm -hmm. there's a, a bunch of things that people do from tissue rehabilitation and engineering to again robotics to you know disability studies uh, to telehealth and telemedicine. Mm -hmm. security for health which is another mm -hmm. big thing and the security can be security of software but it, it can be also hardware security you know secure chips in the little you know machines and devices that you have in the hospital that are wheeled all around and have your data so it's it's an incredibly exciting time to be in this in this area mm -hmm. and this is how i switched you know i was I was working at Bell Labs mostly on communications problems like transmission and so on. But then, you know, towards the end of the 90s, I was getting a little bit not bored. I just wanted a new challenge. And I thought, oh, biotechnology, that sounds, you know, great and exciting. And, uh, you know, the like the yeah. green Larsen protein was just kind of discovered and people were tagging things and biology was becoming uh, much more quantitative than was before. Mm -hmm. And that's why you started having people like me and life scientists talking together and finding this mm -hmm. like, wow, right? They do all this by yeah. hand. Why? Right? That was the first right. question we would ask, right? It's, yeah. It's yeah. Fun. And I, the, you know, next century of biological innovation is going to be driven by statistics and machine learning and computation and algorithms because it's just such big data and um, we still don't even have necessarily all the tools we need to really grapple with it but automation is kind of table stakes to being able to actually no, address these things as like that type of question no yeah. no absolutely and and you know some very simple things that you would think about at a time of 
you know, biologists say segmenting an organ or something, again, they would do it by hand and doing it in 3D was like, you know, okay, how the hell do I do this? Because to do anything with this quantitative, like to measure, to count, like cell birth or cell death or something, you had to isolate it first. And so, and, and you know, automation, as you well know, sounds easy, but it's very hard to do. Yeah. How do you yeah. automate also something that a human does without thinking? Right. Well, and like getting it to do, to automate it once is relatively <laughs> simple. But getting yeah. it to do it a thousand times with no one babysitting it without is breaking like exactly totally different. Yeah. And that you can <laughs> trust it. You're right. That nobody has exactly. to babysit. You know, you yeah, can... that's that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. So you you and I think could talk here till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess if we check the chat. Um are there any any, any questions on the chat? If not, I have more questions. Well, okay. Until other people ask questions, I'll, sure. I'll keep on asking and, and you, know, you know, you guys interrupt me. So beyond COVID-19 uh, testing, uh, what are some other exciting ways that you think users are using your products today? Sure, I mean, there's, there's a really a, a lot. Um, I don't even know where to start. Like the, some of the, <laughs> the projects that are really exciting to me are centered around conservation. Um, so, you know, we, we work with a genetics lab um, that has a project called the DNA Zoo. Um, and basically, you know, eco, ecological parks and conservationists from around the world will send in samples of animals. Um, and they'll create a, a, a genome reference mm -hmm. from that animal. Um, and so, you know, they're getting 11 lemurs today from Madagascar and they're getting some koalas tomorrow from Australia. And it's, they're basically creating this huge open database of um, at risk biodiversity. Um, and, and making it available for people who are trying to you know, steward genetic diversity in the wild and, and make sure that, you know, the different pocket populations of animals are genetically robust in, in terms of population genetics mm -hmm. um, and, and helping them cross fertilize when that's required to, to prevent extinction. And um, so that's one of the, you know, and they're using our robots to process, you know, the sample gets sent to the lab, um, they take it out of the box and they put it on the robot and it starts turning in something that you can put in a genomic sequencer that will read out the, the sequence. Um, and then they have a lot of really amazing statistical stuff that they can do on the end to not only stitch together the two-dimensional sequence, the ATCG, what's the sequence, but also the three-dimensional structure of how the chromosome folds together, um, which is really important for like speciation um, and, and understanding reproducible compatibilities and stuff like that. Um, so that's one of my favorite projects. Um, I, we also have a lot of folks who are in, you know, the cell agriculture space. So, you know, making milk without cows, making, um, you know, uh, gelatin and, um, and like, Animal, usually animal derived mm -hmm. cosmetic progress pro project, like things <laughs> in yeast, right? So they're, they're fermenting these animal products in industrial biotech. So instead of, you know, slaughtering the pig to make pork, they're growing pork in, in a lab. That's like a lab grown meat. And we have a lot of companies that fall into this like cellular agriculture space oh, that's for, um, you know, animal free animal products yeah, yeah. Um, type of things. That's very cool. I just wanted to note that, you know, some of these questions I ask are from the Q&A and from the chat. Okay, cool. Here is another one that's coming from the chat. Uh, how did you meet your co-founders and how did you decide you wanted to start yes. a company together? 
thank you for the opportunity to introduce Chiu, my <laughs> co-founder. Um, he, it, he is a lab automation veteran. He had been, um, you know, he built and sold a high throughput blood genotyping company in New Jersey um, as the VP of engineering and, and, you know, had been building and buying lab automation for like 20 years. And around the same time as I was at Genspace being like, why can't I download this and, and hit run on my 3D printer? Um, he was like, why am I still paying $100,000 for this thing when I can get an open source 3D printer, slap a pipette on it, and there's my liquid handling robot. Um, and so he basically built that prototype in his workshop and put it up on the DIY biology listserv, which was, you know, the cool place to hang out as as biohackers back in, you know, the 2010s. And um, I saw it and I was like, okay, that's actually, I don't have to build the 3D printer for experiments anymore. That's the hardware. I can put this user experience of download an experiment and, and hit run on, on top of that hardware as my master's thesis at NYU. And so I was really the first customer that bought the very first prototype from Chiu out of his garage in New Jersey um, and, and brought it to NYU and, and set it up as you know, my, my thesis project, um, which then we decided to apply to an accelerator um, called Hackcelerator, which is in Shenzhen, China, um, mm -hmm. focused on bringing teams to Shenzhen to embed them in the hardware supply chain. Um, and you know, that, that was when we were like, okay, we're going to turn this thing into a Kickstarter and we're going to figure out how to, you know, source between 25 and 50 in China and do a Kickstarter and, and fulfill that living at Genspace, right? Um, and, um, and maybe we're going to start a company based on that, you know, our investors certainly hope we do. <laughs> um, and um, we, and, you know, that's when, you know, we, we spent the whole summer in Shenzhen completely embedded in the supply chain, building the first prototype. I mean, Chu building the first prototype. Um, and then came back, did the Kickstarter, um, got those 35 machines from all the prestigious universities um, and had to actually, and, and that was really when, like I said, when it was like, oh, I, I actually see the, the business case here. Like actually a lot of people want this thing. And the way that we're building it, we can sell it at a 10 times lower price than anyone else and still make money doing it. Like we're not losing money because we have this totally different supply chain that we're using. Um, so uh, that, that was really the moment when it became clear that this was a, a business that we should build. Um, and the, the next year, you know, we got into Y Combinator um, Six months after that, we got invested in by Coastal Ventures, and that was kind of when the wow. snowball started awesome. rolling um, and, and got us to where we're at today. Um, so, you know, back to the specific co-founder question, um, I think that there are two general types of co-founders, um, both of which are totally cool and have built impactful and important companies. Um, one is, I think of it as like the dorm room, the best friend co-founders. Like we don't, we don't know what we want to build yet, but we like each other and we know we want to build a company and we're going to like go out and do customer discovery. And, and like Airbnb is exactly this, right? They, they had no idea what they were going to build until they discovered, you know, renting air mattresses on people's apartment floors at conventions. And then they're like, okay, that's the big <laughs> You know, that's the perfect example of the like friends building a business together. And Chu and I, I think, are an example of the second type of co-founder, which is um, the thing that brought you together is the idea. You yeah. are true believers in the same thing. And, you know, I'm closer in age to Chu's son than to him, but we both believe very much in the importance of building this thing and have complementary strengths. And, um, and, you know, that's what brought us together was, was sort of the mission. Um, and so, like I said, I think that there are two totally acceptable types of co-founder. Um, and generally you have to either 
you know, really like the person and then decide what to build or decide what to build and, and get to really like the person. Like you have a tool <laughs> through, through and that. find what, what to use it for or you have a problem and then find a tool to solve the problem. Exactly, yeah. There, there yeah. is another question from the chat and it says, what advice, apart from, I guess, uh, having a garage that seems to be a must for many of these startups, uh, would you give to an entrepreneur just starting to launch a company in the biotech sector? Um, you know, I, I think that the, I can't get too specific without knowing more specifics, but the key is really thinking about how you're going to iterate really quickly through those design, build, test um, iterations. Like you, whether, you know, you basically need to pick what the, what's the thing that you got to do over the next 18 months to make sure that you get your startup to the next level and it doesn't die. And how are you going to make sure that you get enough shots at doing that, that you're actually going to achieve it. And, um, and the key thing as an early stage startup is saying no to every single good idea so that you can say yes to the great ideas because you do not have many resources. Um, and if you work for two months on something that ultimately doesn't actually get you to the next stage of your startup, then you basically wasted two months and you have two months less resources um, to actually get to the point that you really need to get to. So, um, you know, my, my very general advice is make sure that you have a really rapid iteration cycle that is has a very strong, um, good signal from the, you know, something external to the company. Um, usually that would be your customer, but in biotech, sometimes that's hard because you're like in drug discovery or something and the customer is very far away. Yeah. But you still need a scientific advisory board or, you know, a, a strategic investor or somebody from outside the organization who's providing a key check on your internal processes as you're going through the design, build, test, learn loops. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, whatever, whatever equipment you can find to deploy to increase the number of times you can go through that loop in a given stretch of time is the right equipment to get. That's great. So listen, uh, since we're coming to the end of this last question, quickly before okay. we wrap up, as your team grows, again from the chat, what do you prioritize when hiring new staff members? Are there particular backgrounds, skill sets that you think are most helpful? I don't usually think about like, you know, sometimes you need a, somebody with the right technical background for a job, right? You, you make a job description and you're like, okay, in order to be this network sysadmin, you need to have five years of network sysadmin experience, right? And so there's definitely an element of, you know, right background, technical background for the job, right? Um, but I think that, you know, there's also things that apply to every candidate um, that aren't specific technical background, especially at an early stage company. So this is not applicable to every type of organization. Um, but I think that, you know, people who are really, you know, we always say missionaries, not mercenaries. You, you care about doing the job because it matters. And um, that's what gets you to work every morning, every day, because, um, you know, the, the, it, it's hard. Startups are really difficult. And, um, and having that kind of mission orientation and, and strong pull um, is really key to getting through some of the most difficult moments of failure that are inevitably part of the process of, of starting a startup. Um, so yeah, missionaries versus mercenaries, I think is a really important um, aspect early stage. Um, I, I also think that highly curious is one that I often over index yeah. on because it's a good, uh, sort of proxy for a lot of important things like compassion, teamwork, um, you know, honesty. Yeah, exactly. All these things. So, um, 
people who you know ask really thoughtful and and genuine questions and, and are and and who get excited i think people who let themselves get excited are important at an early stage too you need people who are like raw raw kind of yeah um totally so. agree i mean i i would use some of these when i choose my phd students so totally agree. yeah Listen, yeah. I had the ball talking to you. I hope everybody yeah, else. Thank you for the great questions. This is awesome. So Regina, uh, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Will, so much. Thank you. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, I just um, really want to thank both of you for spending the time with us um, this afternoon. Um, I learned a lot, which was great. And um, I know our audience really did. So thank you very much to our audience as well. Um, sign up for our newsletter and follow us on Twitter and Instagram and stay tuned for more opportunities to engage with Brooklyn's innovation leaders and entrepreneurship community. So thank you so much to Will and Yelena for spending the hour with us. I learned a lot and I'm so excited that we have the best minds in Brooklyn working on um, what will be some of um, our our time's um, toughest challenges. So thank you very, very much. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Will. Thanks for setting this up. Thanks, Elena. Okay. Bye, Thanks. guys. Bye. Bye, everybody.